as dementia progresses so many people ask do they still recognize you it's a logical and understandable question but as someone's condition deteriorates through dementia for us the more important question became do we still recognize them so while realizing that everyone's own situation is very different we have put together some of the personal experiences that helped us as a family find life and love through the pain and challenge of the dementia experience. Theo was diagnosed with dementia aged 77. He and Rachel had been married for 50 years with three children, John, Sarah and me, and six grandchildren. Theo died in 2018, 10 years after his diagnosis. And these are our shared family reflections. Theo had been a partner in a Birmingham law firm and had a brilliantly incisive legal brain. But we'd seen anxiety levels rising gradually over several years. So the diagnosis finally confirmed there was lots more change ahead. The diagnosis was like a sort of bereavement, opening up a whole range of possible emotions, maybe fear, alarm, anger, disappointment, confusion. But I know we both also sensed an element of relief that the condition was finally identified. So we now knew we just had to get on with it together. Like so many others, we tried to read up and understand everything about dementia and how we could all face and live with it, with Theo's condition and inevitable decline. But in reality, it was really the personal experience more than the theory that helped us to stay in step with him and with one another as the dementia progressed. Living with it, acknowledging the pain and the loss, but also embracing the new situation and wherever possible, noticing and affirming the life and even sometimes finding the fun. So we want to share some of the pictures, the stories, the personal experiences that helped us as a family to find life and love through the challenges of dementia hoping that this may be some help to others. We've captured these as a series of eight separate themes, each one illustrated by pictures and personal stories. The big starting point from which everything else followed was moving from head level communication to heart level understanding and we had to let go of the rational and move from focusing on facts to recognising feelings. In one area of the brain, facts, rational language and communication were becoming increasingly damaged. But in a different part of the brain, feelings remain intact if we could only access them. So our communication with Theo shifted more and more dramatically over time from head level to heart level. And some of our happiest moments were all about feelings and nothing much else with shared laughter even sometimes when we didn't know precisely what the joke was we drew, drew inspiration from maya angelo's great quote people forget what you said people will forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel we found the book contented dementia really helpful in learning to move from facts to feelings including three invaluable rules the first rule don't ask questions questions focus on information so they can create anxiety about whether or not the person knows the right answer so instead of saying what did you do this morning we found it might be more helpful to come in with a more general comment perhaps I wonder if it's been a busy morning. And the second rule, don't contradict. It just undermines someone's confidence if you keep telling them they're wrong and it'll only cause additional stress to everyone. And the third rule is learn from the expert, the person with dementia. Just watch someone's eyes and you can pick up whether things are connecting. So when Theo said to me, in fact on the doorstep just as we, I was leaving, he said, we've known each other for a long time, are you older than me? And a uh, strange question, I could have corrected and contradicted him, responding at a head level, saying, of course I'm not older than you, you're my dad. Or I could have asked another question back, I'm 56, how old are you? But instead, 
I wanted to just affirm the feeling of connection, that the heart level response. And so I said, we're great friends. I've known you all my life. So I wanted to affirm the connection. Similarly, when Theo asked my brother, Andrew, are your parents still alive? Andrew's heart level reply was, oh yes, they're very much alive. These, these conversations don't really focus on the facts or the information. They're heart to heart, not head to head. They help recognize and reassure, prompting really positive affirmation rather than more anxiety. When someone's living with dementia, we found you have to be prepared to set off and find them in their own world. Think of it as crossing the bridge. So Christopher Eccleston, whose father had dementia, explains, I eventually learned that instead of trying to pull people with dementia into your world, you have to enter theirs. As Theo's dementia progressed, we came to realise that the bridge was always getting longer. Sometimes it was even hard to know where the bridge was, and we had to experiment and use guesswork to enter into the reality of Theo's world. But it remained essential we at least had a stab at finding the way across entering into Theo's world as best we could. And when we could enter and access his world, we found it was a place of real engagement and we could happily lift anxiety there. Just as Theo had had the imagination in previous years to enter into his grandchildren's world, so now they and all of us needed to use our imagination to cross the bridge and enter his world. Although it might be an increasingly unfamiliar world you're crossing into, it's there that the point of connection is to be made. And once you're there, it can sometimes be surprisingly uplifting and even an energising place. It's difficult to make much sense out of dementia. And increasingly, we found it better to accept the unknowns and not to try to pin things down too precisely. Of course, you have to acknowledge the pain and the loss, but you don't need to be afraid of them. While it's disorientating, there can be playful times too, if you go with it and improvise a bit. Morris Sendak's children's book, Where the Wild Things Are, has a great line. And now, cried Max, let the wild rumpus begin. We found Theo's dementia meant we had to be prepared to embrace this wild rumpus, whatever it was, and to recognise we weren't in control. And also, we needed to be willing to find some zany fun in unexpected places. Theo came to enjoy the familiarity and ridiculousness of a talking Churchill the dog soft toy. Oh yes, he would say along with Churchill. And we even found one that did the occasional, oh no was often a source of both humour and comfort which we could share together. Later on, Theo enjoyed the company of garden gnomes at his care home. For some reason they made a connection and he enjoyed the fun of them. One sat on his windowsill and he would sometimes talk to it referencing our friend over there. We found it was so much more liberating to accept and embrace this vaguely surreal world he was letting go and so it was important that we did too. It was certainly a completely different world from the legal precision of his formal professional years, but accepting the situation allowed us, including perhaps Theo himself, not to hold on to fear, and we could all enjoy moments of shared laughter together. So it meant we could stay connected with him for much longer, sharing in the randomness, and he was clearly much more animated and happier if we were able to accompany him along on this ride. So much of our dementia experience was about letting go of conventional behaviour and expectations, rational thought and explanations, and of course, ultimately, a Theo. But so much was also about staying in touch with our feelings and with our hearts, where we still could connect with Theo. Language can so easily overwhelm and overload the brain during dementia. 
And at a certain point in the progression of Thea's dementia, we found that using very short sentences was a much more powerful way to connect. So when I was talking about a trip to somewhere he'd known well, um, I found he couldn't engage or understand. So I stopped and I thought, and I simply said, we're going camping. And he immediately connected and his face lit up. Oh, how wonderful, he said. At that time, those, those three word sentences really helped comprehension. But as rational conversation became more challenging and less meaningful, we needed to discover new ways of finding common ground and connections. We enjoyed creating some wonderfully engaging and increasingly simple family picture books. And Theo took great delight in looking through these and reading them out to us, whether accurately or not. As his dementia advanced, we made books with fewer words and more pictures, tuning in to what felt life-giving at any given stage. Theo really connected with dogs in a new way, both our dog Whisper and Gillian's dog Pedro. In fact, Theo and Pedro formed a bond of mutual admiration, so much so there was a time when Theo would happily share his picture book with Pedro. A toolkit of objects was also a great way of making connections when words were beginning to fail. An iPad to look at pictures together, or a few familiar objects. For Theo, there were connections to be made with an old briefcase or some cricket bales. As language began to diminish further, we found freedom in new activities and non-verbal communication. Playing ball was always a great way of enjoying time together without the need for language or communication. Music was another way of connecting, whether listening together or even marching around the room to a military band. And um, when we brought 80 seashells to celebrate Theo's 80th birthday, there was complete absorbing delight in, in arranging these shells together on a stool. Familiar activities could be very reassuring. I love just knitting quietly or playing the piano, simply communicating by steady non-anxious presence to Theo, who could listen and watch contentedly, feeling the steadiness of my continuing presence with him. Touch also became increasingly important. Literally, we were simply staying in touch. Dementia is progressive and it is relentless. It's an ever-changing journey, and often a very tough one too. As things changed, we found we were always trying to play catch-up to keep up with Theo's current reality. We had to live in the present, we had to keep letting go of the past, and we couldn't understand too much about the future either. We found the image of a kaleidoscope helpful in engaging with the ever-changing realities we were facing. Each pattern is new and different, and it keeps changing too. So it's a hopeless exercise to try and hold on to a previous pattern, much better, however difficult, to focus on the current pattern and try to find the beauty in it. So while we all needed time and space to grieve the loss of the old patterns, we also found it helpful to tune into the life of the new and different ones that kept emerging. We needed to accept the flux and flow and change of whatever the present reality had become, um, acting and readjusting accordingly. And this meant listening for repeated questions or anxieties, but also noticing what made positive connections and increased well-being as well. We enjoyed this Zen dog cartoon about accepting and living with the ever-changing and often unclear reality of the present. He knows not where he's going, for the ocean will decide. It's not the destination, it's the glory of the ride. For us, this meant letting go of Theo the solicitor and enjoying the man in the cricket hat instead. And when shaving became hard going, letting go of that too and moving to the age of the beard. For Rachel, this meant recognising when Theo became wholly reliant on her and when both he and she needed extra help. There was a wonderful team of helpers when Theo was still at home, some friends, some carers who became friends. 
Moving Theo to a care home was definitely the most painful decision of the whole of my life, I think. But there was a tipping point when I finally recognised it was the best way forward on balance for Theo and all of us. It was just too precarious trying to run a nursing home at home for one. Over time, as Theo settled into residential care, he enjoyed more company with others, and I was freed to be a spouse and partner again. My energy is free to focus on keeping my core connection with Theo as patterns inevitably continue to change. That was my focus instead of being frontline carer. Recognising the changing nature of Theo and Rachel's partnership, we were helped by thinking of two overlapping circles, like a Venn diagram. These moved together and apart again as things changed illustrating more or less overlap in their relationship, sharing experiences together in the overlap in the centre, but also individual ones separately where the circles don't overlap. In our marriage pre-dementia, as in many relationships, we'd enjoyed shared experiences together, but also individual ones separately. But as Sears dementia progressed, our circles overlapped more and more, and he was increasingly dependent on my support, till our two circles totally overlapped, no separate areas left. Then, with the move to residential care, at first it caused a very painful pulling apart of the overlapping circles again. But after about six months, I recognised this actually returned us closer to the pattern we'd known for most of our nearly 60 years of marriage. There was a strong sense that shared life and love remained in the overlapping heart of things for Theo and Rachel, but each of them had a separate part of life as well. This had some benefits, re-energising Rachel and enabling her to do other things as well, but it also helped us explain and understand some of the pain and loss. For example, I couldn't understand the real sadness I felt when I needed to buy a new car, till I realised that all previous cars had belonged in the overlapping part of our life circles, but Theo would never get into this car, so it wasn't our car, it was my car, and that meant it had to belong in the separate bit of my life circle. And when I recognised that, I started at last to enjoy the new car. And we were so thankful, too, to have confidence in the separate part of Theo's life circle, in the loving care and new friendships surrounding him when we weren't there with him. Dementia can be bleak, but as well as giving appropriate space to mourn what we'd lost, we also found it important to make space to celebrate what we'd still got. There was a suitably apt quote on the wall at Theo's care home. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. Positive affirmation was so important. And Theo's own life philosophy, while he could still articulate it, encouraged us all to notice this perspective. And he always said, there's so much to be thankful for. While he could still express it in words, he'd affirm others with the cricketing words, well played. And when the communication moved beyond words, it was by clapping. The acknowledgement, support and encouragement of other people that went right back to his cricket watching days. We were fortunate that right through, Theo continued to give us positive affirmation, just as much, if not more, than we were giving to him. So at the different stages of dementia, as far as possible, we wanted to look at the glass as half full as opposed to half empty. A great inspiration, in fact, for this is the Paralympic Games, encouraging us to focus not on people's disabilities, but on their abilities instead. That positive affirmation meant recognising and ideally celebrating Theo's core inner person still tucked away somewhere beneath all the confusion. With so much obviously and so painfully lost, it was sometimes really hard to see that but it meant we specially relished the precious little glimpses and connections when they did come. It's a bit like these two pieces of pottery. 
any contents of the bowl are clearly visible, but you only get a glimpse of what the vase is holding. The space inside may be the same, but it's much less visible. The core identity as dementia progresses may become more and more hidden, but knowing that it's still safely tucked away somewhere deep inside helped us to keep a positive connection with Theo in spite of the changing outward reality. Theo had always loved cricket, both playing in younger life and watching in later years. As time went on, he got into the habit of wearing his Warwickshire cricket hat, both outdoors and indoors. In one way, it became a symbol of his core identity. We think it represented security to him, acting as a comfort blanket. It was also a point of recognition and connection with others, signalling something of his core identity, whether people had known him while he was still able to enjoy his cricket or not. Encouraging us to make the most of the situation, I respect the way a couple living with dementia use the motivating perspective of living with, not dying from dementia. Dementia is overwhelming and impossible to cope with on your own or within a family, however supportive the family unit. Just as people say it takes a community to bring up a child, so we found it took a community to travel forwards as Theo's dementia progressed. So we came to recognise the essential importance of teamwork and the bigger team and support we needed as time went on. Different people could contribute in different ways and in lots of ways close friends and carers became like extended family to us as they stayed in step with Theo and with all of us too. We couldn't have managed without the invaluable teamwork of family and friends at home and later the outstanding care team at the Royal Star and Garter home where Theo was to spend the last three and a half years of his life. We were inspired by the teamwork example of wild geese who can travel 70% further when they fly in formation, with a different one taking up the lead at any one time. Mm -hmm. Sir Alex Ferguson talks about this as part of his Manchester United teamwork philosophy. Remember the geese, he would say, stopping training and telling his players to look up to the sky, observing the V formation of Canadian geese on their 4,000 mile journey during which each bird would take its turn at the front. Mary Oliver captures this in her poem, Wild Geese, which encourages us to listen to our own feelings, love and despair, and to learn from the bigger picture of the natural world and the wild geese, recognising that we're part of a bigger picture, connecting us together within a wider family of things. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. To avoid causing Theo unnecessary anxiety, we found it worked best to slip in and out when Theo had moved into residential care, not making a big fanfare about our entrance and exits. So we left our coats outside and avoided saying hello, or I'm going now, or see you tomorrow. We wanted to remain part of his world, sometimes in sight and sometimes out of sight, which of course was true in so many ways. We, and we had the confidence in the other members of the team who were there when we weren't. For the whole team, family, friends and carers, clear communication was so important. To share together what was working and what wasn't, and how things were changing. We were so grateful to the care team making time for honest conversations about how we were all feeling too, as well as Theo. It was about mutual respect and caring for one another. No martyrs and no stars, just solid, democratic, mutual support and teamwork across family, friends and carers. This enriched us all. 
at the same time as helping us find the best achievable quality of life this year. Dementia can be disorientating and confusing, even frightening. We don't know where we're going or where we're going to end up. It was like suffering three bereavements in a way. First, losing Theo's rational mind to dementia, then losing his physical presence from home to the care home, and finally losing him to death. And each was a further journey into the unknown. There was a lot of letting go of control when we didn't know where things would be, would be leading. It meant letting go of planning and sorting out, letting go of certainties. So the only thing to do was to live each day together while keeping an eye on the overall sense of direction with flexibility and as much openness as we could. Theo had always loved the absurdity of Edward Lear's poem, The Hour and the Pussycat, who went to sea in the beautiful pea green boat. So we used that picture of the hour and the pussycat to acknowledge that we were still travelling together, but no longer needing to know where life would take us. Rachel captured some of these feelings in some lines she wrote in a haiku poem. We are here, floating free, baggage lost, rudder broke, living, loving, now. Theo was setting sail, and our role was to support him on his journey. We were powerless to drag him back from it. Trying to do so would only make it more painful for him and for all of us too. So we wanted to wave him on as we were beginning to lose sight of him. The analogy of boats helped us accept the journey Theo was undertaking and we were all experiencing as he journeyed through stormy seas and beyond our horizon. We found real inspiration in this picture called Pilgrim by artist Jake Lever, showing boats in the harbour, perhaps representing all of us, with one boat leaving and heading out to sea, pointing to Theo, journeying on. This is what Jake Lever says about his picture. A cluster of tiny boats take refuge in the harbour to the left. A family, a community, friends. Way out into the wild tidal sea, there is a single lone boat, heading out from the harbour or possibly returning. The voyage is significant, costly and frightening, yet essential for growth. It is a journey that only this little boat can make and a journey undertaken alone. So has the boat felt abandoned? Certainly not. The presence of the community in the harbour is precisely what has given this boat courage and strength to set out into the open sea pilgrimage. The sense of their presence never leaves the boat. Perhaps it is the journey through cancer or dementia, or maybe the final journey crossing the threshold from life to death. In the end, that journey proves not so frightening. There are fragments of gold on the seabed that are scattered across heaven and earth. Theo's dementia certainly took us all into uncharted waters. But in many ways, we found we were simply drawing on skills we'd already been learning all our lives in other situations this repeatedly letting go and finding new patterns. We've done it all through our lives in different ways. Change is simply a part of all living and ultimately all life ends in death. I've heard this summed up neatly by someone living with dementia. Dementia may be terminal, but then so is life. And Japanese author Haraki Murakami comments that Death is not the opposite of life, but a part of it. 
In Theo's funeral service sheet, I shared these words encapsulating our feelings about the later stages of his life through advancing dementia. Thank you for the dance of life and love, freed from words and intellect. A lot of what we experience couldn't really be put into words or explained rationally, but at the heart of things, there was a giving and a receiving of love. Malcolm Geith sums this up in a sonnet. Now is the time to loosen, cast away the useless weight of everything but love. And that same love still manages to connect us with Theo today.